Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. It's January 21st, 2023. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let's talk about a fight. It's an important one because the authorized video is online. Not some YouTuber's video of the fight, but the authorized video. And because it's a short fight, you can watch practically the whole fight. They cut out some dull parts, but you see most of the action. Now that's very important because it gives us an opportunity to look at the film together. This is also a rare opportunity. We're talking about the Liam Smith knockout of Chris Eubank Jr., right? This is a rare opportunity because I did not make a pre-fight video on this fight. So I'm not here trying to explain or justify an earlier pick. Understand my motive is just to look at film and to figure out what happened what does this mean for the future? Understand, too, this is that rare opportunity where we're not here crowing about the judge's decision because the judges were not involved. There's no controversy on who won the fight as the winner won the fight by stoppage and knocked down the badly hurt opponent twice. So there is no reasonable claim here of, let's say, a flash knockdown, right? Because the person who lost hit the canvas multiple times, right? So we're going to analyze this fight from a different point of view because I want people to understand, and this fight should be exhibit number one, that sometimes in boxing... The better fighter does not win. Your betting model has to accommodate for that. If, let's say, the better fighter does not win a minimum of 20% of the time, right? If the other guy wins at least 20% of the time, then when the casinos release these lopsided lines that imply some certainty based on talent level, then you need to be prepared to take the other guy a portion of the time, right? We need to say, you know what? I think Lennox Lewis is better than Haseem Rockman, but reports are that Lewis hasn't taken his camp seriously and Lennox Lewis has a bad habit of dropping his hands. So if the odds get crazy, I'm going to take Haseem Rockman. Let me give you a better example. Mike Tyson was dynamite in the 1980s. Lord knows he was excellent. But Buster Douglas, in the lead-up to the Tyson fight, had actually given guys like Tony Tucker tough fights. You also looked at Douglas and you understood Douglas had a jab. So the minute the casino went up over 10 to 1. You had to ask yourself, wow, does Buster Douglas have more than a 10% chance of winning this fight? Well, folks, that fight, the casino went north of 30 to 1. That was the misperception on Mike Tyson, right? Tyson, Hall of Famer, I'm not saying otherwise, but he wasn't that much better, was he, than Evander Holyfield. Right? A Tyson Riddick Bow fight, who knows what would have happened? Right? Riddick Bow was too young during the Tyson reign, but let's just say, as Riddick Bow matured, you had to think to yourself if these guys fought 100 times, or better yet, 90 times, we'll pretend the line was only 30 to 1. Believe it or not, it was higher than that. I'll let you Google it and see the different lines in different countries. But if you believe that if those guys 
fought 90 times, a Buster Douglas would only win three of the 90. Then the line was appropriate, right? Let's just say we know now the line was not appropriate. Tyson had a hard time slipping Buster Douglas's jab. Buster didn't get knocked out in the first round. Buster's hanging around in the fight. Yes, Tyson knocks him down. Yes, an argument can be made. It's a long count. Right? But you also realize that Tyson's getting hit with shots. Right? A 30 to 1 line is what you would place on a pro team over a college team. Folks, in professional fighting, both of the guys are professionals. When you look at a guy's background and you see that he's fought a Tony Tucker, <laughs> right, you realize he's been in against world-class competition. Right? Understand, too, the lines are really a spur-of-the-moment type thing. Right? It's an image thing. At one point, we thought Anthony Joshua should be the overwhelming favorite against Andy Ruiz. Understand, when Andy fought Anthony Joshua, Andy had already fought for the heavyweight championship. Andy wasn't only world class. Andy had already been on the big stage. He fought Joseph Parker in, I believe, New Zealand or Australia. Right? So these lines are illusory in a sense. So let's talk about this fight. Folks, I know this is not what you're hearing today. The day after the multiple knockdowns. The day after the Liam Smith victory. I know people are going around and they're saying, I told you, I told you, I know Liam Williams thought Liam Smith was going to win the fight and he did early. But folks, look at the film. Chris Eubank is the superior fighter. From how I watch boxing, it's not close. Understand, Liam Smith has what Teddy Atlas calls rabbit ears for defense. He has his hands literally like this. He can't operate from too far away from you. He has to come in the pocket. That's a must. In other words, Liam Smith needs a pocket. He needs to be close to you. He's banking that his tight defense is going to stop your shots and that he'll be able to hit you hard and go to the body. That's his game. He's world class. Let's remember, Liam Smith has fought people like Canelo. He's fought Hall of Fame boxers. Right? But understand, that style doesn't have the high ceiling that Chris Eubanks' style has. You'll notice Eubanks actually can operate outside the pocket. Eubanks has skills in the pocket too. But Eubanks can keep you outside and you have to get through his jab. Also, Eubanks is what I call adaptive reactive. In other words, you see him in the first round and he's feeling out an opponent. Then you notice he makes adjustments. In this fight, he makes a major one. The film's not that long. I encourage people to look at it. He realizes that he has a free shot. If he frames it right, he has this free shot from time to time. Liam Smith is like this. Chris Eubank has a right-hand uppercut available to him when he wants it, right? Now, guys like Evanda Holifield would have a hand like this. The idea is you throw an uppercut, I'm going to periodically have my hand right here to block the uppercut. I'm not going to take a step back. I'm going to come inside because once I have your uppercut under my hand, I can then hit you. You have one hand tied up. I'm going to punish you for throwing the uppercut on me. 
Liam Smith never makes that adjustment. Right? He keeps getting hit with Chris Eubanks' uppercut. Also, Eubanks, unlike Liam Smith, doesn't have to be on his front foot to be offensive. Eubank can actually be on his back foot. Have you walking into a jab, and as you slip the jab, Eubank can hit you with a bunch of punches. That uppercut I'm talking about, a right cross. Eubank also is the physically bigger fighter. So as you watch, notably the third round, by the third round, you're thinking to yourself, okay, this is just a matter of time. Eubank is landing flush shots. He knows where Liam Smith is going to be. Smith is going to be in the pocket trying to shorten the space. So Eubank, who's on his back foot, but he's winning the third round, Eubank is creating space by moving laterally. That's the other thing. Eubank is a master at moving laterally. He can move to his left. He can move to his right. Eubank has the better legs. Now, I'm pointing all this out because Eubank loses the fight. Right? Knockouts cause amnesia. Both of these guys are likely to fight again. Perhaps not each other. And understand, if they fight each other, there's going to be a psychological component now that might not be favorable to Eubank, right? Rematches are tough. Rematches transcend what I call the math. But as they fight other fighters, what's just happened is the odds on Chris Eubank winning have dropped, right? If they announce a Eubank-Golovkin fight, you're going to have a sizable portion of the public. Sizable saying, oh, Eubank looked terrible against Liam Smith. Not that Eubank was winning the fight before the knockdown, but that Eubank looked terrible and that Eubank might be washed up. I'm seeing where even guys who shouldn't have a voice, Connor Ben, right, talk about a shamed fighter, is coming out now and mocking Chris Eubank. Right, okay, okay. I get it. Eubank's not going to win any popularity contests after getting knocked down twice. Right? Understand, Eubank is so messed up that when Eubank gets up the first time, he can barely stand upright. He's bluffing. Right? He goes over to the ref. The ref could have called the fight then. But let's talk about why he gets roughed up. Eubank is backing away from Liam Smith. Liam Smith lands an excellent right hand. Now, maybe this was planned by Liam Smith. Liam Smith, KG Vet, both of these guys. Liam Smith lands an excellent right hand up top on Eubank, who is backing away and is just trying to dodge shots to get to the next sequence. Right, so Eubank is relaxed, perhaps too relaxed. Eubank is backing away from Liam Smith, and he's just moving the dodge shots. Now understand, perhaps that's a mistake. Maybe in that situation where he was close to the side of the ring. Maybe Eubank should have thought to himself, because of where I am in the ring, Instead of going backwards, or trying to go backwards, maybe I needed to come forward and to tie up Liam Smith's right hand. Maybe I needed to clinch instead of to try to back up when there wasn't much room to back up and dodge shots. Well, he gets hit with the right hand, and it's a tough right hand, and he slowed down. So at that point, Eubanks is vulnerable. Understand what ends the fight. They're not clear on the telecast. What ends the fight is an unusual, unexpected punch from Liam Smith. 
It's a left-handed uppercut. In other words, Eubank gets hurt. Eubank has other angles blocked. He's not expecting Liam Smith to come in with the left-handed uppercut. That might be the first left-handed uppercut. Liam Smith has thrown the entire fight. That's the punch that ends the fight. Right? Eubank is hurt off the right. But he looks like he's on his way to recover from that. He gets hit with the left. Uppercut. Not a cross. Not a hook. Not a jab. It's a left uppercut from right-handed Liam Smith. And it ends the fight. On the telecast, they tell you, whoa, they're surprised that Eubank hits the canvas. They say, oh, that didn't look like much. Right? They're saying, oh, you know, didn't look like Eubank got hit that hard. I want you to look at the replay, folks. That left uppercut is concussive. He lands it flush. I think what happened in the moment was everyone's focused on Liam Smith's right hand. Right? The left uppercut is hidden. That's the best punch either guy throws the entire fight. So, to sum up my views in a nutshell, Chris Eubank is still elite. Right? Yes, I picked him over Connor Ben. Right? Chris Eubank is elite. I believe he gives a lot of guys. A lot of guys at 160. Big time trouble. I believe there are guys at 160 who have somehow found a way to avoid fighting their major competitors. Maybe now they'll give Chris Eubank an opportunity. I also understand. I consider Golovkin to be better than Liam Smith. Golovkin's bringing some other dynamics to the table. Right? Golovkin has more ring coverage. Golovkin's punches are more unorthodox. Right? The flaws make the diamond. But I believe Chris Eubanks against Golovkin, that's a competitive fight. I believe at least for the next fight or two, because Eubanks lost and lost badly, right? Lost by a KO, not some close decision. Right? Looked bad when he got off the canvas the first time. I think you're going to have a number of people who are going to undervalue Chris Eubank and who are going to shape public opinion. Chris Eubank is still dangerous. He just got caught by a very determined KG veteran opponent who understood when he had Eubank in serious trouble, he had to be inventive. And that's what Liam Smith did with that left uppercut. Think about it. Right-handed guy has Eubank in trouble. Doesn't just come in wild. No, he comes in and he is reading the scene and he throws the left uppercut as Eubank is covering up from practically everything else. Right? So, great fight. Noteworthy fight. It's a short film for people who want to just break down film, go ahead and do so and leave your impressions in the comment section of this video. Chris Eubank got caught. I believe Chris Eubank can be competitive at 160 and at 168, where he used to be. Right? If I'm Chris Eubank at this point, I would ask myself, I would look at the film. I would see how badly hurt I was off this knockdown. And I would ask myself some tough questions. I know Eubank is into nutrition. I know he's into plant-based protein. Yes, gamblers research all this nonsense. I know he's into plant-based protein. Maybe he needs to get back to red meat. Right? Obviously, I'm from an older generation. <laughs> Let's just say... Your body weight has a lot to do with your punch resistance. If you were at 168 and you were able to take shots from guys with punches like George Groves, right? If you had a chin 
at 168 on red meat. Why would you, two-thirds into your career, drop down to 160, go without the red meat, and expect that you would have the same punch resistance? Right? Understand at heavyweight, Andy Ruiz has made a decision to carry extra weight. Right? Everyone looks at Andy and says, oh, if he just lost some weight, he'd be even faster and more effective. Right? Andy has pointed out that losing weight makes him more susceptible to getting hurt. The added weight helps his punch resistance. I know it's counterintuitive. But if you're Chris Eubank, you have to ask yourself a lot of questions. Should you be fighting Conor Bam? even at 160, over, let's say, Caleb Plant at 168, right? Understand, 168, folks, is getting crowded, right? Canelo went to 168. There's some major money, right? Benavides and Caleb Plant are getting paid for their fight. Andre has gone to 168. Right? When big names start to gather around a weight class, that's the place to be. Unless you have some kind of competitive advantage somewhere else. I want people to look at the shape Eubank is in when he gets off the canvas from the first knockdown. Don't get me wrong. I think that left uppercut thrown by Liam Smith was hellacious. Let me disagree with the commentators. I thought the punch was hellacious. But I thought Chris Eubank was really out of it at that point. Right? The second knockdown is really a variation of the first. Eubank is so diminished by that point. Right? My advice to Eubank would be, play, you're now in your 30s. You used to be at 168. Do you feel dropping weight this late in your career is the best move? Let me hear from you. I thought the better fighter lost this fight. Understand, the better fighter, in my opinion, loses at least 20 to 30 percent of these fights. That's why I always talk about if these guys fought 10 times. Because I don't believe the guy who wins the first time is necessarily going to win all 10 times. Right? I congratulate Liam Smith. He certainly was prepared. He was certainly determined. Right? But even after this win, I think he has a lower ceiling than Chris Eubank. I believe Eubank is not the same fighter he was when he lost to George Groves. I believe he's a better fighter now. I believe he's added things to his game. The spacing is a lot better now. He seems to have an idea on sequencing. That works. Look at his fight against Mr. Robot. Right? So, just food for thought. I'm sure when Eubank is talking to advisors, the different guys have different views. Right? Roy Jones extremely fast at heavyweight, perhaps too fast for many of the guys at heavyweight. But yet Jones made a decision to go back down to light heavyweight, and he started losing fights, right? I'm sure there are a lot of people in Chris Eubank's ear right now. My suggestion to Chris Eubank is to get a good ribeye, ask for the A1, Get back to a traditional diet. See how your body responds. Listen to your body. If you're eating good food, red meat, and the scale jumps to 168, player, that's, that's where you are, right? Because sooner or later, your body is going to let you know who's boss. I believe that happened to Chris Eubank in this fight. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you.
I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Let me also add, too, there was an excellent fighter, Chris Bird. Now, Chris Bird was a middleweight, right? This story needs to be told and thought of. He was a middleweight. He didn't like the checks he was getting. So he decided he was going to gain weight. And he gained weight all the way to heavyweight. Now, sure, he was a blown up middleweight fighting at heavyweight. But he was winning big fights at heavyweight. Right? He was a very good heavyweight. Understand he had the coordination of a middleweight and he had what I consider to be elite defensive skills. He's one of the best defensive skilled fighters I've come across. I know that's not how he was remembered. Then he decided he was going to change his fitness regimen. He went to plant-based proteins. He lost weight, right? He got older. He decided, hey, I'm tired of getting hit by heavyweights. Let me lose weight because I've been in the ring with heavyweights. I should be able to handle the punching power of guys in lighter weight classes. Folks, it fell apart on him. Right? I'm just telling you, even when you're an overblown middleweight who's gone to heavyweight, age matters. You can fluctuate your weight when you're in your early to mid-20s. I'm just giving you my opinion. You give me yours in the comment section of this video. But once you get into your 30s, it's perilous. Okay, you tell your body, hey, we're, we're going to come in a weight class lower. I'm curious to see what happens in Adrian Broner's next fight. You tell your body, hey, we're going to come in a weight class lower. Right, I've been offered this fight at this lighter weight. Let me, let me go to this lighter weight. Right, I'm just telling you, while you can make the weight, while you can cut out the, you know, pork, the bacon, the uh, ribeye, and while you can make the weight, do you really want to? Right? Look at Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. In his fight at 164 against Canelo. Folks, he lost the weight to make that catch weight of 164. Right? We don't talk about it enough. I understand Jr. Uh came in of many fights unprepared, hadn't trained hard, even got beaten by non-boxer Anderson Silva in a fight we need to look at. But understand, even if you knew what Junior looked like before that Canelo fight, he looked like a ghost in that Canelo fight, didn't he? You were looking at that fight and you thought, who's this dude Canelo's fighting? You said, oh, oh, that's Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Weight deprived. Junior, he was weight deprived. He he looked like he needed a meal during the fight, and the fight was the day after the weigh-ins. Right? But yet, weakened. Junior went the distance against Canelo, one of the hardest punchers pound for pound in the sport. So as you're looking at that fight, just think to yourself, how did Junior's people allow this to happen? If you have enough talent to go the distance with Canelo, weight drained at 164, shouldn't the fight have been at 168? Junior, who had a great left hook, might have won that fight. Right? The weight matters. You can make weight, lose punch resistance, lose stamina, Right, still be highly skilled. Obviously, Junior had skills to go the distance with Canelo, which is saying a lot, quite frankly. A lot of guys haven't gone the distance with Canelo. Right, but I'm just telling you, you're a different guy at the lighter weight when you're in your 30s. Anyway, that those are my biases. I thought Chris Eubank, before the fight, was going to win it. Didn't say so here online. Didn't make a pre-fight video. I think uh, Eubank still has a bright future, right? I want him to sit down with the ribeye.
right? I see the talent here. I know he's a better fighter than Liam Smith, who just stopped him early in a multiple knockdown fight. That's how I saw it. Let me hear how you saw it in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.